please join me in giving our own ambassador, Melaine Verveer, a very warm Atlanta welcome. We're so happy to have you. Womenetics. Who would have thought uh, that that simple statement of you haven't thought big enough would create this incredible assemblage? And you are quite a sight uh, to look at uh, from where I stand. I want to salute Elizabeth and your extraordinary team uh, for helping to create this truly dynamic and most needed network. Uh, of women, connecting them as you do to each other and enabling them to have, all of you, to have greater success, uh, not just professionally, but personally. And you are all creating that ripple effect, uh, and I know it will continue to grow because I believe strongly that we should never underestimate what a group of committed, talented, highly motivated women can achieve. You know, as a diplomat, I am especially pleased that Womenetics is working so effectively to erase the impression, unfortunately an impression that still lingers, that there is a substantial gap that separates what are called those international issues and domestic issues. Today, as the United States continues to exert its leadership in world affairs, our increasing interaction with the rest of the world means that the world's issues are our issues and our issues are the world's issues. This is especially true to economic issues because economic globalization is a fact Ask any of the businesswomen who are in our midst today. It is a major fact, and it is possibly the critical defining feature of this century. And look around Atlanta. You know, perhaps this busiest airport in the world is a metaphor for everything else that is happening in this city from the mega global corporations, too many to name, to extraordinary institutions, nonprofit institutions that affect the world, like the Center for Disease Control that our own government is so proud of, and I have seen firsthand its impact in so much of the world. So in many ways, as Atlanta goes, so goes the world. And that's where all of you come in so significantly. Because we live in a world that is so interlinked that it is neither wise nor sufficient to address issues today of major import without examining their global dimensions. And as Womenetics recognizes, in addition to exporting and importing goods and services, we should also be exporting and importing ideas, experiences, and solutions, sharing those lessons that are without borders. And so many of those lessons have been incubated here in Atlanta. The professional women of the United States can impart their experiences and their knowledge with so many others around the globe, engaging and collaborating. And I have seen what a difference it makes to have a mentor from the United States to a woman in so many other places around the globe. And this forum that you have created is a real model of a global business and economic dialogue among women, by women, for women, but a dialogue
that benefits everyone. And that is the most important fact, that when we talk about women's issues, yes, they uniquely affect women, but they are about really making a better world for everyone, men and women, boys and girls. The current issue of Foreign Policy Magazine focuses this time on our experience in the United States. Remember Rosie the Riveter? She was that emblem of those women who went into America's factories during World War II and helped to manufacture the equipment to send the greatest Air Force, Army, and Navy in history into battle. And it's good to remember them today, especially because it is, after all, Veterans Day. But Rosie's motto was very succinct, and I must confess I like it very much. We can do it. And in my office, we have a Rosie poster with that motto emblazoned across it to inspire not just our own staff, but women everywhere who visit us, because truly, we can do it. And as Foreign Policy Magazine reports, the economic history of the last 50 years has been the entrance of the female half of the population into the workplace. Women started to work out of necessity, but they stayed when jobs became careers. They were hired in a hunt for diversity and kept because of their talent. The result has been a world-changing revolution. Today, women are just not good for the bottom line. They're fundamental for bringing nations out of poverty, and they not just might be the future direction of work. After World War II, the United States saw a significant increase in national income, largely due to women's work outside the home. And in recognition of that fact, President Kennedy signed the Equal Pay Act in 1963, aiming to close the gender gap in wages. And at that time, a woman earned about 60 cents for every dollar earned that a man had that was comparable. Well, as we know, the gap is closing, but the gap is still a gap. And there is still a glass ceiling, or as a friend of mine says, a very thick layer of men to penetrate through. <laughs> Women still aren't in great numbers in the very top jobs in companies and institutions. Yet we know that the best ideas flourish in a, in a diverse environment. Imagine, today in the United States, half of our workforce is comprised of women. In almost two-thirds of our families, women are either the primary breadwinner or the co-breadwinners. Without their earnings, the economic viability of many of our families, particularly in these difficult times, would be far worse. Decade by decade, as women's economic role in modern economics has expanded, we have learned more and more, unfortunately or fortunately, to do something about it, about the inequities, those barriers, those roadblocks that still, still persist for women, both in top-end economies like our own, and economies that are far less affluent and productive in much of the world. Several years ago, and I still remember this as though it were yesterday, I was traveling with the then First Lady, Hillary Clinton, in Africa, and we were riding in a van with a minister of economics from a country I will not mention. And he was going on and on about the fact that women in his country have no role in the economy of that country. 
And, uh, you know, he was talking, I'm sure, about the formal economy, but nevertheless, he went on about that until the First Lady had heard enough. And she said, uh, Sir, I'm looking out this window, and I'm looking out that window, and as far as the eye can see, there are women bent over in the fields, many of them with children on their backs, carrying wood, carrying water, doing the farming that is getting done to prepare the meal for the night that is coming. And you tell me they have no role in the economy of your country. If they all stopped working for one day, your country would stop. Now, let me give you a macro example of what the economic empowerment of women could mean if we tapped the potential of women's economic participation, which still is a largely untapped reality. At the State Department, we have been working to place this issue on the agenda of many of our economic arrangements, those platforms in which we participate. The President, for example, today is at the G20. APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, or AGOA with the Af African Growth Opportunities, or Pathways to Progress on rela trade relations with South America, in all of these arenas and so many more, to really put a focus on the possibilities that the participation of women economically could do to grow the economies of all the participating countries, including our own. And it really struck me because my colleague Wen Shi Yu, who's here, and I were in Japan uh, several weeks ago at the APEC Women's Entrepreneurship Summit, first ever uh, coming together of high-level representation from government and the private sector to focus on women's role in the economy in the Asia-Pacific region. And that will be carried to the United States next year because we will be leading APEC next year as Japan was this year. It is calculated that the Asia-Pacific region, 21 economies, is shortchanged in excess of $40 billion a year in GDP because of the untapped potential of women in the economy in the region. Forty billion dollars. Now, gender inequality is hardly a soft issue. It is a hard issue linked directly to economic growth, to prosperity, to peace and stability. Today, there are many converging studies they come from the World Bank, they come from the World Economic Forum, from the top corporations, from think tanks, and so many more. And each and every one of them shows in some way that investing in women is a high yield investment. The World Economic Forum, hardly a women's organization, but they put out an annual study called the Gender Gap Report. And what this study does is it looks at the equality between men and women in a given country on four uh, measurements. Health, survivability, educational attainment, economic participation, and political empowerment. In those countries where the gap between parity between men and women in those four areas is closest to being closed, where it is narrowed dramatically, and in no, in no country is it closed, but where it is narrowed dramatically, those are the most prosperous and competitive economically countries. That's where there is the greatest productivity. And the United States this year, they just released their 2010 report, finally broke into the top 20. Uh, but it is mostly the countries in Scandinavia who dominate uh, in these, uh, in these uh, areas uh, and where there has been such a focus on narrowing the gender gap. 
It is also interesting that in this study, greatest progress has come in the areas of closing the gap in education and in health, but not as much progress in economic participation and the least progress is in the political empowerment of women in closing that gap between men and women in government and politics. So as you heard, and I say it, and I will say it probably as the last words before I drop someday, no country can get ahead if half its people are left behind. It is a fact, and gender equality is a key condition for any country's progress. The fact today is also that we are witnessing a dramatic change in the role women play in the global economy. While some of the progress being made is very encouraging, particularly to all of us who care about a better and more accommodating environment for women, there are many, many significant challenges that remain both at home and abroad. These are challenges, as one would expect, that impact the family, the workplace, and economies everywhere. I firmly believe that if our governments and the private sector and all of our co-collaborators worked more closely on appropriate policy solutions and market-based solutions, we would be able to develop and apply greater prospects for progress for sustainable, balanced, and inclusive growth, the kind of growth we all hope for. So let me just focus on three important areas among so many. First, women as entrepreneurs. Women as entrepreneurs offer people everywhere so much pro promise. It is a fact that SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, drive economic growth and create jobs. And women run small and medium-sized businesses are particularly strong drivers of GDP. In fact, one CEO whose company has done a lot of studies in this area said this is the lowest hanging fruit to pick to drive GDP. It is true overseas. It has been certainly true in our experience in the United States. Women-owned enterprises in America have better growth rates and better loan payback rates than those run by the men. And I love the fact that there are so many men here and this is not to pick on the men because we all need to work together, but it is a reality. But sadly, while women own 40% of US small businesses and contribute over a trillion dollars to the US economy through those small and medium-sized businesses, many of the equity investments, capital investments of the United States do not go, the great majority, in fact, only 5% go to businesses owned by women. And only 3% of women entrepreneurs get investments from venture capital. So globally, the story is even worse. Women face many, many barriers that hinder their economic participation. Barriers to training, no access to mentors, to technology that they need to start or grow a business, to markets. There are many laws and regulations that discriminate against them. In some places, they can't own property or don't have inheritance rights. But if you were to take a poll, what you would hear over and over everywhere is that the major challenge for business growth among women is the lack of access to finance. 
And there is a significant gender gap in access to finance that is particularly acute when it affects what we might call the missing middle. Those small enterprise, that small enterprise sector, which is mostly women run and has the best growth and job creation potential. Several years ago, here in the United States, when I was working in the White House, we visited with some uh, small business owners, uh, women-run business owners, and one in particular has always stayed with me. Um, it was a, a group of uh, women, very small in numbers, who were eager to start a tech business. They had a great strategic plan, they had done everything right, uh, and they really felt that if given the opportunity, they could really grow this uh, enterprise. And as one of them said to, um, to us, she said, you know, the best ideas die in bank parking lots. She had had, and her colleagues, had had such a difficult time getting the kind of capital they needed, and that wasn't huge amounts. And in fact, it was a micro-enterprise in the United States that focused on not quite the micro-sized loans that are provided in the developing world that came to the rescue. That company went on to hire over a period of not that many years up to almost uh, 100 employees. So they had a good plan, and they have proven themselves but they had a very, very difficult time getting the capital. Now, all over the world, micro, very small loans uh, have increasingly been available and have had a transformative impact on the poorest of the poor, and I know there are some in our midst who have worked in this field. And so many times when I travel, and, and have over the years, I have seen firsthand the extraordinary difference these small amounts of credit make uh, for a woman to buy a milk cow uh, or to get a cell phone that becomes a thriving, very tiny business that transforms her life and the life of her family and brings in the kind of income that so makes a difference uh, for, for them and for their very small village community. And one time we were uh, with the Grameen Bank. I'm sure you've heard of Grameen. Mohammed Yunus has uh, gotten the Nobel Prize for Peace Prize for his work that goes on. And uh, we were with a small group of Grameen borrowers in this village in Bangladesh and asked them how they decided to become borrowers, why they decided to become borrowers, and what they hoped for, and of others, what had been achieved for them. And there was this couple uh, who explained that they were having a very difficult time making the decision as to whether or not they should avail themselves of this program. They desperately needed uh, this small credit. Uh, they desperately wanted to improve their lives and the lives of their children. They knew exactly what kind of impact it would have. But there was a certain mullah in the village uh, who was talking about the evils that would come from this, especially, I think, having to do with the greater independence of the wife in this, in this family. And they were really struggling because they were people who were deeply committed to their faith, uh, yet they wanted a better life for themselves and their family. And they, in the end, made a decision to accept the credit they paid back their loan, uh, their lives were in a better place, and they punctuated this story about where they were today by saying, and when our son grows up, he'll be a different kind of mullah. Let me also talk about women as leaders, both in business and in communities. We know that the numbers in the corporate sector for women in the top uh, 600 companies around the world is still a tiny, tiny percentage, about 5% who are at uh, 
that level. And in the process, I think, of not having more going in that direction, we are losing out on female talent, but we are also working to make a difference that more of that is developed and can come forward. At the State Department, we have created a number of programs, many of them focused on business training and mentoring, because we know this is a critical need around the world for women. And many of them have been brought together in partnership uh, with the business community. For example, uh, one of the programs is one that we collaborate with the Fortune All Powerful Women Summit uh, that meets annually and comprises of many of the companies here as well as so many more in the United States. Uh, and what we have done is been able to bring younger business women from the developing world, selected by our embassies, uh, together with some of the most extraordinary female corporate uh, uh, executives, like many of them in this room, to mentor them over a period of several weeks uh, in the United States. Uh, the first week is an orientation uh, through an NGO where they get to uh, meet senior women in, in our own government and in academia and, and learn communication skills and the kinds of things that are very useful to all of them. Uh, particularly to understand why these kinds of investments require much of them, require much in the future uh, as they pay this in investment forward. And then they go on for three weeks uh, to the headquarters of companies and are mentored directly in those things, those areas that they most critically want to know more about to grow their own businesses. We are now in the fifth year of this program, and I have worked with it uh, previously, and I always ask when I travel if it's not too hard on the embassies if I can meet with some of the Fortune mentees, because I'm always eager to know how did it work for them, how has it changed them, what are they doing today? And I am always so, not so surprised anymore because I've seen it so much, but I'm always uh, so impressed with how they take that investment that was made in them and they, yes, they're growing their businesses. They are uh, doing so much better than they ever dreamed, but they are also paying it back and they are investing in their community. They are creating mentorship programs where they never existed in their countries. Uh, they are creating associations of like-minded people. They are going on to solve uh, the kind of community challenges that they are uh, equipped by virtue of the standing that they have to make a real difference. And we have comparable programs involving the business community, for example, uh, in the Middle East, where we've got vibrant uh, women's business networks that we have supported and are now uh, highly self-sustaining and which continue to have strong collaboration with women in the United States. We've just started a new program called Tech Women that became very clear to me uh, was something that could have tremendous impact when we went out to Silicon Valley and so many of the women executives said, you know, use us. We're here, we have blazed the trails in our fields. We want to make a difference uh, for others who want to get into the same business in their countries. Uh, and so we will create these kinds of partnerships and mentorship and training programs involving women in technology. So women's economic participation, uh, growing economies, is so critical. And that leads me to my third point, which is why invest in women and why should we care about women, for example, in the developing world? They are critical from a very self-interested point of view to the emerging markets that we are all going to be hoping we can sell our services and our products to in the world. It is calculated that upwards of 
of economic growth will come outside of the borders of our own country. So those markets will say a great deal about our own economic future. Moreover, investments in women and girls correlate positively with strong positive outcomes in poverty alleviation and a country's general prosperity. Better health outcomes and greater opportunities uh, to have progress in so many ways. Women's work also provides a multiplier effect because women will invest upwards of 90% of their income in their families and communities, investing in health, investing in education, investing more broadly as a result in the future of the community. And investing in a girl's education is the single most effective development investment that can be made. Larry Summers, who is hardly known today for his seminal work in this area, but when he was a young economist at the World Bank, he wrote a definitive paper on this point. And over many decades later, it has stood the test of time. And now there is a mountain of data to support the fact that this is among the best, most effective investments that can be made. Because when you educate a girl, you educate a family, and you educate a community. And it reaps benefits in terms of her own future employability and what that represents for, for economic well-being, as well as for her future family. Women also represent today the growing consumer power house of the world, the largest potential market outpacing China and India combined. It's women and the growing economic power that they represent because they make decisions for how resources will be spent most everywhere. In a, just a few weeks ago, Mutar Kent, Mutar Kent, the CEO of Coca-Cola, of whom there has already been mention, and of the initiative that uh, Coca-Cola launched to empower uh, 5 million women entrepreneurs by the year 2020, he said that this 21st century goes to the women. And he went on to say why. He said the only way a projected billion people will rise to the middle class in the next 10 years. The only way the world will grow by $20 trillion richer to lift up people everywhere. The only way nations will rise out of poverty and become politically stable will be by women achieving gender parity on a global scale. And he said, if we fail, the world economy will fail. Robert Zellick, another male leader, president of the World Bank, put it a little differently, but with the same meaning. He said, and the World Bank has programs to underscore this, that gender equality means smart economics. Nick Kristof that voice to lift up women and so many around the globe and in our own country, columnist for the New York Times, said that the moral imperative of the 21st century is to end women's inequality. So this is clearly both the right thing to do and the smart thing to do. Each of you is helping to chart the path to a better tomorrow. And this conference, I think, is an important conference for so many reasons, not the least of which is its global focus, uh, its global outreach. 
Women's progress in the United States and women's progress in the world are very closely intertwined. Women are the greatest untapped resource on earth with the greatest potential market and a force with the instinctive inclination to put things first when we assess our society's greatest needs. It doesn't help to overstate this thesis, and I would not place all the weight of the 21st century on womenomics. But unless we speak up, unless we connect with one another and cooperate with one another, unless we act, we won't change the world as we think and know it should be changed. So I wish you so much good coming out of the panels that will follow this afternoon, that they will resonate in word and in future deeds over many years to come. I want to thank Womenetics for bringing us all together uh, and for all that I am confident will emanate from this great city uh, in the months and years to come to create the ripple effect from Atlanta around the world. Thank you very much.